Hi, it's Dr. Sandy Laura Kramers. Thank you for joining me on the third podcast of the EYE Show. If you're listening to me on our podcast, I hope you will pass this on and send it to friends and family. Uh, Last time we talked a little bit about the causes of dry eye, and we told a couple of stories of the addiction of screen time and even talked about a favorite saint of mine named Padre Pio, but I won't do that this time. Uh, This time we're going to talk a little bit about the innovative treatments and remedies for dry eye disease. And so thank you for joining us again, and please, please send this on to people that you love. So I'm one of the surgeons here at Visionary Eye Doctors, and I also work at Johns Hopkins Medical Institute at Suburban Hospital. Uh, So when we talk about the latest innovative treatments of dry eye disease, it's kind of interesting because we, we talked last time how there's many eye surgeons that pay little attention to dry eye disease. And part of the reason is because as a surgeon, you're taught to cut things out and you're really impatient and you really kind of want to get instant gratification because you see a cancer, you cut it out and the patient sometimes is cured. In eye surgery, there's definitely instant gratification. When you have a cataract, the patient is potentially even blind or very poor vision. We cut it out patient is eternally grateful. So it's a wonderful profession. So when you talk to a surgeon about something that's chronic, like dry eye disease, and the symptoms of those are things like burning, uh, so I wrote these down and made a mnemonic, burning, uh, irritation, foreign body sensation, uh, pain, blurry vision, uh, itchiness, reflex tearing, and dryness. So it's one of those things that you kind of think, well, what can I do to make it faster, you know, better, faster? And dry eye disease is not that kind of disease. It's a chronic disease, and it's very difficult to explain that to patients. It takes time, it takes empathy, and a lot of surgeons don't want to deal with it. So for many, many years, I've had patients complain that their surgeon or even their eye doctor uh, doesn't take their symptoms seriously. They just give them a bunch of drops, you know, good luck, and then they'll pass them on. And so they feel very frustrated because they know there's something more that can be done, but their doctor hasn't been able to kind of sit down and explain it to them. And even with my patients, they are overwhelmed by the information because there's a lot of information. You have to understand a little bit about the anatomy of the tear film. Uh, There's so many more treatments now, and it can be very overwhelming. So this part of the podcast, we're going to kind of break some key components down. When we talk about innovative treatments, it's also kind of interesting that as surgeons, we have kind of gone back to basics. So one of the most innovative treatments there is for any disease is your diet. And I have so many surgeon friends that are really now refocusing on their diet. Many years ago, my father, who's a cardiothoracic surgeon that I mentioned before in a previous podcast, he's been a surgeon for about 40 years. He trained with DeBakey and Cooley, the first heart transplant surgeons in the country. And he, we're from Bolivia, so his typical diet was meat and potatoes and and diabetes producing food. And he finally went to the doctor after, I don't know, I don't know, probably 30 years. And the doctor said, you're pre-diabetic. And that sent shivers down his spine because he knew what that meant. And what it really means for him is what he said is a slow, painful death. And he did not want that. So he immediately changed his diet from one day to another and went low carb. Not only low carb, but extreme low carb to the point that he would call me and say, guess how many, guess how many carbohydrates I had today? <laughs> he really would. I said, I don't know, dad, how many? Zero. I had zero carbohydrates. Like that's, that, that's not possible. No, no, really. I had zero carbohydrates. So he was very, very passionate about really going low carb. And, and for, for a long time, he was really less than sometimes 20 grams of carbohydrates a day. That's like half an apple. So he was very passionate. He lost tons of weight. He cured diabetes, which is true. You can cure diabetes or pre-diabetes. And he went on this mission, you know, where if you, if for us, he would say, you know, if you give your child bread, he would call me a child abuser, which is my dad. Um, but it's true. He really kind of felt very passionate about uh, the low carbohydrate diet. And this is a surgeon who was trained to kind of be very impatient, get to the cure, let's just get to the cure. And he's going back to basics. And so in dry eye also, we know that the fundamental problem with dry eye disease, as with most diseases, is inflammation. 
That's the fundamental problem in death is inflammation. The death of the cells often is due to inflammation. And inflammation means that there's no new blood vessels or even new abnormal blood vessels that are not providing the right nutrition to the tissue and then the tissue will die if the tissue has senses a lack of oxygen, uh, more new blood vessels will be produced, which can bleed. And in the eye, there's so many surfaces. We see that process frequently in the retina. We see it in the conjunctiva, the surface of the eye. We see it in dry eye disease, even in the meibomian glands, where you have patients with rosacea or patients that start to develop kind of this inflammation. And so what a lot of surgeons I know that are, that are in ophthalmology are refocusing on the most interesting, innovative procedure is your diet. And so I wanna read a little bit about what I've learned about diet in the last uh, 15 years or so since I started paying attention to this. So, you know, we, we all know that bad dietary habits will cause disease. We know that excessive sugar and gluten and carbohydrates can cause diabetes. And, you know, we know that it's important to turn your diet around to basically start fighting disease, not just prevention. Uh, prevention is huge, but even treating disease. So many years ago, I did this really kind of self study on what kind of diets are out there. And there's many doctor diets out there. I'm sure many of you know, you've heard of Dr. Atkins. He developed the Atkins diet, which is basically a very high fat diet, very low carb diet. There was controversy about when he died that, you know, did he die of heart disease because his, you know, vessels were so full of fat. We don't, I don't know. But, you know, there's, that has some positives, some negatives. There's Dr. Furman, one of the surgeons here at Visionary Eye Doctors told me about his journey with Dr. Furman and actually went on a retreat with Dr. Furman for a week to learn his diet. And Dr. Furman has a very strong plant-based diet, which is very strict in certain foods like you, I don't think you're allowed any salt or olive oil or there's certain things with Dr. Furman's, but a lot of beans and no meat and very, very vegetarian but it helps with cholesterol. And then there's Dr. Gundry's diet. Dr. Gundry is an anti-lectin diet. Lectin is in tomatoes, nightshades like uh, eggplant. Uh, he is very strict about trying to decrease inflammation because he believes that lectins cause inflammation. So fresh tomatoes are bad. Stew tomatoes for a long time may be okay. And then there's Dr. Longo. Dr. Longo is a doctor, a researcher, a PhD in California who I think has probably the best diet out there for cancer patients and probably for most diseases, but it's a very difficult diet to follow. It is not easy. It's basically almost like a starvation diet, but it's, it's, it's works. It does work. So there's all these different doctors. They're all kind of trying to explain the underlying issue is that when we eat food that increases inflammation, our body will respond by forming scar tissue, whether it's in your blood vessels or your eyes or your heart or your joints. There's many things you can do to change your life by just changing what you put in your mouth. And I talk about this every single day, more than I ever have in my entire life because I'm following this diet. I'm very low carb. I'm not on Dr. Longo's diet, but I have tried it. It's not easy but I know it works. And I think I've told you this story in previous podcasts, I mean, previous uh, videos. This is a true story, which is incredible. So I have a friend whose oldest sister died of breast cancer. The youngest sister, two weeks after the funeral, found a lump in her breast and she went to the doctor. And the doctor said, you have uh, breast cancer and you have, they did an x-ray, the MRI, everything. You have metastasis to your pericardium of the heart, which is the covering of the heart, you have metastasis to your spine and to your liver, and you have three months to live. And she had two young kids at the time. And so obviously this was horrible because her sister had just died. And the doctor said you had three months to live because when I was in medical school, and I think it's still the case, when you have metastasis to your liver, it's usually the very end, right? So there's only a few months. So she was obviously very upset. The whole family was had been clearing out her older sister's house, and the younger sister named Lily, who's a one was wonderful, wonderful, wonderful woman, was looking was looking through her journal, and came across her older sister's cancer journey, because her older sister had talked about all the treatments she was thinking of doing and what she wanted to do in her whole life, 
And the younger sister saw that her older sister wanted to try the Gerson diet. Dr. Gerson was a doctor, I think around the 1960s, who developed a anti-cancer diet, uh, kind of in the direction of Dr. Longo, who's now our, our generation. Um, but somehow he lost his medical license for some reason. I'm not sure why, but he was ostracized to Mexico and he was seeing patients in Mexico for years. But basically it is a very low carb diet. It involves enemas, three times a day, smoothies with everything organic like vegetables, uh, checking your blood work. It's very, very involved. You can find it online. So she decided with her husband to go to Mexico, I think it was for two solid weeks to learn this diet and to learn how to do the enemas and all this other stuff. And so I interviewed her five years later. I think it was five years later. And I couldn't believe it because I was like, no one teaches this in medical school that you could cure, you know, at least delay cancer's death with a diet. I mean, I've never heard of such a thing. And so I asked her, you know, so what do you do? And she told me that she doesn't color her hair, no makeup, no uh, furniture polish, no perfume, no, everything's organic, no pesticides in the house or in the lawn. Uh, they clean their clothes with only certain types of, you know, the natural detergents, what she cleans her body with, no deodorant, uh, very, very kind of natural life. But she went on to live about nine years after that three-month diagnosis. A few years after that original three-month death sentence that the doctor gave her, she went back to the same doctor and the doctor was like shocked that the tumor was receding and she didn't know what to say. She didn't say I was wrong. She just said, keep doing what you're doing, you know, keep doing what you're doing. So Lily died very, uh, just a few months ago actually. And it was very hard because she really taught me that you can treat cancer. You can treat pretty much any disease with diet and maybe not alone, but it definitely complementary. And maybe it is alone, we don't know. So it, it's something about diet, everyone that's listening, please do your research, whatever disease you have, whether it's joint pains or, or you know dry eye disease or heart disease or cancer, look at that and if you if you have a family history even more so start now think about what you can do so that was very beautiful to kind of learn that lesson how we all can choose sometimes our own fate by what we put in our mouth so that's very helpful so that i found that very helpful so we all have also a surgeon started to learn more about the gut microbiome and the microbiome has about 37 billion trillion bacteria in our body. And it's interesting how that bacteria is kind of friendly bacteria. And why has it become friendly in some, you know, most people? Why do we have all this bacteria all over our body and in our guts? And why do some people have problems with that bacteria and some people don't? And even with COVID, you know, we saw this. We saw in all the surgeons, all my friends were talking about this. Of course, my father and I talked about this at length that those patients that had high inflammatory markers in their blood when they got the COVID virus did much worse than those that didn't. And so we know that inflammation is, was definitely a killer in during COVID. So the virus was huge, of course, and it would spike. But then after a few weeks of having been sick, if you were in the ICU on a ventilator, it wasn't the virus that finally killed you. It was the inflammation response to the virus. So changing your diet today makes a big difference for tomorrow and for the rest of your life for yourself your family your kids so you know remember that and then even within medicine there's new two organs which have been really more understood so we all know about the eye being an organ the heart being an organ your your lungs are an organ but something called the mesentery and the interstitia so the mesentery is basically surrounding the intestines and and the interstitia is the tissue around the organs that is full of these these mol these cells that really try to protect us against inflammation so we really know that's a very important issue and then finally we um so know that researchers have found that everyone has about 10,000 mutations per day in their dna and the question becomes why does one mutation become a cancer whereas maybe the other ones don't in some patients versus others so again you have a lot of environmental factors like your diet uh, what you put in your house uh, in your lawn that are very important so, you know, there's, there's no magic pill to kind of treating often many of these diseases, but please remember about your diet. And then, so now let's talk a little bit about kind of innovative treatments in the eye, aside from diet. And we talked a little bit about there's three ways to slow down the gland loss. So we're going to do a little show and tell here. And so just to remind everybody, this is the glands. If you're listening on the podcast, I'm showing again the picture of the myboming glands of these white lines that are filled with oil. 
and we just want to avoid any darkness of scar tissue that we can see. So there's really three categories to slow down this gland loss. The first one is blinking, warm compresses, massaging, trying to pump that oil out manually at home. Heat is the only way to open the orifice to get that oil to kind of melt out. And then blinking pushes it out and massaging pushes it out. So that's the most important thing. So blinking and all the, the kind of warm compresses. The second is called Lipaflow thermal pulsation. We have an example of Lipaflow. And so we just try to show the machine. It has these applicators that basically it's a milking machine. And so what it looks like, it comes in these sterile little packets, looks like this. And so there's a little diaphragm. This is a little contact lens there that goes on the surface of the eye. And then there's a diaphragm that kind of goes around the eyelids of all four eyelids. We put one on each, we connect it to the machine. It's a 12 minute procedure. I've had it done. It's not painful. I compare it for women <laughs> to mammogram. Um, for men, I don't know what to compare it to, but it's like that pressure on discomfort. Um, but it's basically trying to milk the oil so the body will produce more oil. And so that and eye Lux are two procedures that are called thermal pulsation and they're FDA approved to slow down the gland loss. The second, the, that's the second category. The third category are much more uncomfortable and they are not FDA approved. So let's show you the Intense Pulse Light, which is this machine. This is the Intense Pulse Light Stellara M22. And what it does is basically we use a kind of a device here, this kind of probe here, that we put along the eyelid margin and apply a very bright light. What we do first is we usually will put a metal contact lens like on the surface of the eye. Some patients have too small of a palpebral fissure. We can't get it into the eye, so we put covers over the eye that are metallic. The only risk that's been reported with intense pulse light to date which has been used for years for hair removal and uh, helping with the skin, improving uh, collagen and maybe even wrinkle helping, uh, is discoloration of the skin. But when some uh, ophthalmologists use it on the eye and did not use the metal contact lens, there's been at least one case report I know of, of inflammation in the eye called uveitis. So we do not want that. That's why we use the metal uh, contact lens. So it's very important to do that because some people could have a negative reaction to the light. So let me just show you what it looks like. It feels, this one, some of them are very uncomfortable. This one feels actually not too uncomfortable. It's very, very cool uh, touch. So this gets really cold. So you don't, when you have cold, it helps with pain. So it kind of masks the discomfort of the bright light that usually feels like a rubber band hitting your face. So let's see, I think we will, and I won't shoot it, but basically we, the person doing the procedure will wear protective goggles. The patient is lubed up and we usually go across the face and then we go into a room to express the oil. So this works very well. We are also, we're using this now also for acute sty. So let's say you have a little bump starting. Uh, you may have heard in a previous video, there's three ways to treat a sty. The most important is right away warm compresses. I tell patients to get a hot pot of water. I take my finger, put it right in the water right away and then I push, push right on the bump like trying to express a pimple stay safely and then basically continue to do that kind of compresses I tell people a hundred to a thousand times a day because you want to get on top of it right away if you don't it'll form scar tissue and then you will need a steroid injection with or without surgery that's the second way and that's approved by insurance the third way is IPL intense pulse light it works really well we've had now about 20 patients that we've been able to get rid of the sty or the chalazion without surgery or steroid injection. The problem is we have to get to those patients before one month. The sooner, the better. If you wait after a month, it doesn't work as well. So just keep that in mind. So this is the intense pulse light. Okay, so the other thing about intense pulse light is that usually there's multiple sessions needed and it can be very, very frustrating because it's expensive, it's not covered by insurance, but it does work. And so what we do here at Visionary Eye Doctors is we'll do a procedure, one procedure of intense pulse light, we videotape the expression and we express every single gland. And the way we do that is just basically either use a metal instrument to kind of roll out the oil or even uh, two Q-tips that are very thin to kind of roll out the oil like you're milking a cow.
So that analogy is similar with the glands. The more you milk, that's why blinking is so crucial. The more you do heat, the more you do IPL, if your skin will tolerate it, the better. So most of our patients need about six to eight sessions to feel back to kind of down below the two out of 10 symptom score. So we try to ask patients, what's your number one symptom? And on a scale of zero to 10, 10 being the worst, 10 out of 10 being you think about your eyes all the time or you're even kind of that you know suicidal point, we don't want that. We wanna bring you down as close to zero out of 10. And we do the IPL until the oil comes out like olive oil, not like toothpaste, but like olive oil. And if there is no oil coming out, we do that next option, which is called probing. So you guys have seen my step ladder before, all the things in yellow are to kind of slow down or save the glands and everything else is for symptoms. And so I want to show on the video what the probe looks like. And if you're listening to the podcast, we have a microscopic probe that is quite expensive. And what we do is under the microscope, we basically take the tiny little, right at the end of that tip, there's actually a microscopic little kind of metallic probe. It's not a needle, but it does sometimes feel like a needle. And we go in to every single meibomian gland. And as you can imagine, that is not a fun procedure. It's not comfortable. So it is done under a microscope. You need very steady hands. And we literally go and try to break open any scar tissue that is formed. And we then will express afterwards. And so that is something that Dr. Maskin developed and has been using and it works well to try to break open the scar tissue, allow the oil to come out to allow the gland to produce more oil. So I mentioned in a previous, uh, I think, podcast that there was a paper that showed uh, there was a comparison between the intense pulse light alone, a group of patients just had that, a group of patients just had probing, and a group of patients had both of them together. The group that did the best was the one where you did it together. And the reason is that when there is a blockage of the gland, if you can break open the blockage and then kind of milk it out, they're going to do better. But I have most of my patients do well with IPL alone. They don't need to go to probing. And we know they need probing if there's no oil coming out of the glands. So once we've tried IPL usually about two or three times and there's still not enough oil coming out for the symptoms to go below a five out of 10, we know they need probing. More recently, the innovative, the next innovative thing we've done is we've taken a cannula and these are no longer available as of COVID. So it's been very difficult. This is an old one. I just held on to for just demonstrations. Uh, so it's a cannula. So what this means is it's microscopic, looks very similar, but at the end of this one, there is a whole, there's a uh, kind of like a tube, right? Where it's a cannula, not a, not just a probe, but there's actually like an opening where we can inject into the glands your own platelets, your own autologous serum. Uh, we can inject stem cells and even core blood serum. And what we're trying to do is regrow the glands. So we have an IRB for this. So when somebody has lost their glands and they're usually worse than this stage three, we basically will go into the glands and try to inject their platelets uh, to regrow the glands. And what we found in the initial studies we did that we were able to regrow the glands between about 12 to 25 percent based on an objective, a relatively objective tool called Image J from the NIH, where you kind of actually quantify the, the oil glands. So, so it's exciting. We think we can grow back the glands. But now that the cannulas are not available, we've had this study on hold, which has been very frustrating. So we're trying to restart that as soon as we get the cannula. So that's the next step in trying to find a cure for this disease. And we are, many of us are looking for the cure because we know that the children, our, our children coming down the pipeline are gonna probably be worse off when they're my age and we, or you know, your age. So we want that to, to, to work. And so the other innovative treatments that we really have been uh, very excited about are things like amniotic membrane drops, amniotic membrane tissue. And I think you've heard me tell the story that when you do surgery in a baby in utero in the mother's womb, let's say they have a heart defect and you do surgery, that baby, so in a, in a patient, if you do heart surgery on me, I'm gonna have a huge scar for the rest of my life. They're gonna crack open my chest. They're gonna you know, repair a valve, let's say, or help with my heart. And then they're gonna close me up and either put staples or sutures and I'll have a scar down my chest for the rest of my life. When you do that on a baby, they're born without a scar because their amniotic membrane has these incredible molecules that heal you. So we use the amniotic membrane on the surface of the eye for such diseases as pterygium or pinguecula removal or chemical burn or tumor removal. 
and it looks like they didn't even have surgery. It's so beautiful, so beautiful. And so for the eye, it's very healing. If you inject it into the meibomian glands, that's we haven't done that yet. That's what we're planning to do next. Uh, so that's exciting because we know amniotic membrane has this ability to really regrow your natural cells. So it's kind of exciting. Uh, the last thing, of course, is basically stem cells. And we have done uh, seven patients with stem cells so far. Uh, we think there's definite promise in this technology. We're still now waiting for the cannulas, but stem cells, the way, there's two ways to get stem cells, the two easy ways to get stem cells. Bone marrow, my father does a lot of bone marrow, and fat. And so what happens is basically you just give some anesthetic, either belly fat or love handle fat, and then you basically will inject some fluid to kind of loosen up the fat, and then you do a mini liposuction, just very minimal, to get enough fat to isolate the stem cells. Fat has more stem cells per cubic millimeter of tissue than bone marrow. And we also think that if you are treating a disease that is fat-based, like meibomian gland oil dysfunction, versus stem cell base like leukemia lymphoma let's say you get a better result so for the eye and my booming gland atrophy we think fat based stem cells is better so what we have used stem cells for is to insert it into the meibomian glands and also as drops. And what we know stem cells can do is called cell to cell contact kind of re reprogramming. So when you have an abnormal cell and it touches a new cell, like a baby cell, like your own baby cell, your new cell, that's your own, your own stem cells from your fat, it can make the old cell for some reason start to work normal again. So not only does the stem cell go to the right tissue and start to work normally in many conditions, but it can actually stimulate that old abnormal cell to start working better. So this is the next frontier, and there's a lot of research being done to try to help us harness stem cells. In eye surgery uh, at Harvard, I did stem cell transplants, limbo stem cell transplants. It's something that we've been doing for years. We take a stem cell from either the other eye, the limbus is the part of the eye where it's located around, you see the color of my eye where it meets the white, there's these tiny little cells in a circle around there called the limbal stem cells. Those cells are in charge of making my cornea, the window of the eye, clear. In patients where that malfunctions, the clear part of the eye looks just like the white part of the eye. So the white, their whole eye is just completely white and you can imagine they're blind. So if you take a limbal stem cell and a bunch of them and you put it into the other eye where there's complete lack of stem cells, the cornea can come back to clarity and it's, it's, it's sight saving very, very beautiful surgery and it works. So people have been doing stem cell surgery for years. And so this is very similar to that, trying to harness our own stem cells. But what about stem cells? How can you make your stem cells better? There is a professor at Harvard uh, by the last name of Murray who won the Nobel Prize in Medicine who has harnessed his own stem cells, I think he's about 90 right now, and the stem cells of his kids and grandkids and he's banked them. Because the fact is the younger you are, the better for the stem cells. We know smokers have worse stem cells. We, do, we haven't proven that people with diabetes have worse stem cells, but it probably makes sense that if you're healthier, you have less inflammation, you're younger, your stem cells are better. So we're very excited that we can potentially start to use stem cells, maybe stimulated with something else like a growth factor, like your own platelets, to really Really regrow those cells. So it's a very interesting time because for the first time in the history of the world, we have potentially some ideas at least on how to kind of finally cure the scourge of dry eye disease. So I hope you enjoyed this podcast. I hope you will send me some suggestions. I'm already getting comments about what I should uh, my, my, what I should wear and things like that. So please, please, uh, please subscribe to this podcast and pass it on to friends. And I look forward to talking to you on the next episode. Take care.